Today we read about baboons in an article by Barbara Smuts called What Are Friends For? And over the years, I've been able to condense one of the messages I have about this article into a series of alliterative bees just to watch out. Beware of being bamboozled by baboons which I think some, happened to some of you, I won't pick on any of you, but if something happens when we come into an anthropology class and we think, aha, now we're studying some non-human primates, that must be because they're just like us. And here they are having friendships and stuff, so that must mean they're like us. So I wanna caution you about this because baboons, are not actually very much like us. And when Barbara Smuts went off to do this research, she was not studying them because they're very close to us, evolutionarily speaking. So I did warn you that we're gonna be going back into a bit of the Muckle, Gonzalez and Camp chapter two on the primates in order to explain these evolutionary relationships a little bit. Now, baboons are what we call old world monkeys who are closer to humans than new world monkeys. So this is some terminology that Muckle, Gonzalez, and Camp use, even though they said back on page 22 that they're going to try and get away from this terminology because it's part of a colonial mentality. The new world refers to the Americas and the old world refers to Africa and Eurasia. And we're supposed to be decolonizing that terminology, but in terms of monkeys, it's stuck around. It's a hard habit to get rid of. So I'm gonna look at a map and talk about what the old world is or what the people meant by the old world and what the new world is and where, where this evolutionary stuff is happening. So don't worry, we'll get a chance to go back to these words in a second. So here is the world with a projection that's pretty good. It shows us that in fact, South America is nine times as big as Greenland, even though on Mercator projections, you'd be tempted to think otherwise. Anyway, New World is actually what we're in, or the Americas, South and North America, and Old World refers to Africa and Eurasia over here. And that terminology, got put into place because the Europeans came sailing across over here and said, aha, it's all new. Um, this part of the world has been inhabited for longer, but it wasn't exactly a new world. So we're trying to change this, uh, this terminology, but basically when people refer to the new world or new world monkeys, they're referring to what happens in the Americas versus what happens in Africa and Eurasia. So, uh, and interestingly, I'll just say that Michael Gonzalez and Camp uh, support the idea or the hypothesis that the way that the, the old, the monkeys got to the Americas was probably via a huge floating vegetation raft, which broke off and floated over here about 30 million years ago. Um, and then they started evolving there. So let's go into the New World monkeys and their characteristics. These are also known, I mean, the technical name from them is platyrenes, New World monkeys. They're also known as flat-nosed primates, nose that are a little flatter. All of the American monkeys, and we're talking about mostly in now in Central America and South America. All of them are tree dwellers. They're all arboreal and they are usually 
pretty small in terms of their body size. They all have tails, and some of them also have what we call prehensile tails, tails that wrap around and can grab things or grasp things. There's usually little what we call sexual dimorphism in the New World monkeys. There's not much difference between what males and females uh, in terms of their size and characteristics. Hard to tell them apart from looking at them. And importantly, the New World monkeys were evolving in the Americas, kind of on their own out there, from around 30 to 40 million years ago, which is quite a long time. So they're doing their own thing in the Americas and speciating and evolving and not having contact with what was going on in Africa and Eurasia. Now, if you look at a picture of some examples of monkeys in the Americas, New World monkeys. Here are some of them, like the spider monkey. There's that prehensile tail grasping at limbs, or the capuchin monkey, or the... They're, they're funny, these monkeys. Somebody goes down to Costa Rica and tells you about the monkeys and says, I can't see how we came from monkeys. You can be like, yeah, you know, it's true. These monkeys are kind of goofy looking. They're kind of, they screech around a lot and jump. And it's, you know, you can see that there's some they're primates. They're non-human primates. They're in the family. You got some front facing eyes there and stuff. But in general, you could be, you could be forgiven if you were like, I'm not very close to that golden lion tamarind. That doesn't have anything to do with me. So, on the other hand, we have the Catarines, or what are called the Old World monkeys. And these are of the Catarine, it actually means the sharp nosed primates, the downward facing nosed primates. And over here, primarily in Africa, but also in parts of Eurasia. Many of them are up in the trees, arboreal, but some of them are also terrestrial, they're ground dwellers. They have tails, but there's no prehensile tails among the old world monkeys. They all have or I mean, a lot of them have larger body size. And this grouping, the Catarines, actually includes old world monkeys, apes, and humans, which all, all of these share a dental formula of two incisors, one canine, two premolars, and three molars. We all share that across old world monkeys, the apes, and the humans. In this group, we can have, there is sometimes more pronounced sexual dimorphism. We'll talk about this a little bit more when we talk about our baboons article. But importantly, this group is evolving for the most part in Africa. And as we talk about human evolution, all the cool stuff happens in Africa. And to an extent, parts of Eurasia where the, the big, the large apes, even Gigantopithecus, has his favorite our Hartwick mascot out there, if you go look at it, Gigantopithecus. Uh, is actually something, uh, one that evolved in primarily in what is now China. Um, but these, the old world monkeys are, uh, I don't know, they're bigger, 
They are more serious looking, except for that funny nose. So they're often sitting on the ground or sitting on their tails instead of swinging from them. Larger ground dwelling, sharper faces, noses. And evolutionarily speaking, there are some people who would say that the old world monkeys are actually closer to apes and to humans than they are to the new world monkeys who did split off fairly, fairly long ago. So let's go back to our thing. Old world monkeys are closer to humans than new world monkeys, but not nearly as close as the apes. So we have an old world, new world monkey divergence at about 30 to 40 million years ago, maybe with that floating vegetation raft. And then we have a divergence between the species that would lead to apes and the species that would keep on being ever more beautiful monkeys around 20 to 30 million years ago. By the way, what's the quickest way to spot an ape versus a monkey? How do we know an ape? Good zoo stuff when you're actually apes should should never really be in zoos. They're too smart. But if they have to be, at least you should know that they're there. Hmm. In that video that I showed you of the, I think he's French, he was speaking like a, he was speaking like he had a French accent, that photographer who went off to study bonobos. He Originally, he, he did a little thing. He says, these monkeys, and then he says, apes, no tail. Apes don't have tails. Monkeys all have tails, but apes don't have tails. And then, of course, we have, which we'll talk about more uh, next Friday, the last common ancestor of chimps, bonobos, and humans at around six to eight million years ago. So you have a monkey splitting off between American monkeys and old uh, Eurasian African monkeys about 30, 35 million years ago. Then you have another other, other divergence of, between apes and monkeys. And uh, as we talked about in the last class, uh, the split, the last common ancestor of chimps, bonobos, and humans is probably six to eight, eight to 10 million years ago. So when it comes to the baboons, she's definitely not studying them because they're just like us. They're pretty distant from us. Another 20 million year ago distance. And of course they've been evolving ever since on their own on their own tracks and doing their own things. Um, I thought I'd put up a couple charts of how these divergences work. Her textbook doesn't always have the best charts. So we have among the primates, we have these, these primates that we don't really talk about, lemurs, and they're pretty, pretty distant. So Here's our split between new world monkeys and old world, world monkeys. They put it back about 45 million years ago. Some people think it's more like here. I mean, you know, millions of years, it's difficult sometimes to get. And these are not necessarily clean splits. It's not like one day you wake up and, and you're off in a, in a different species. These often take place over long periods of time themselves. Then we have the divergence between old world monkeys and the apes, gibbons, orangutans, gorillas, and then this kind of divergence. Or if we focus on the, the orangutans, probably diverge off about 12 to 15 million years ago, gorillas at 10 to 12 million years ago, 
And then here's last common ancestor of humans, chimps and bonobos. Uh, we talked about in the last class how there was a speciation that happens after the last common ancestor at you know, one to two million years ago. Bonobos and chimps form their own their own species. So this gives you a sense of some of it, the evolutionary relationships. Now, we now need to then go back to what, why was Barbara Smuts studying these baboons? If she's not doing it because she thinks they're just like us, why would you study these baboons? And she mentions this a couple times at the beginning and also at the end. There are some neat baboon scenes all around, so you might be forgiven for not picking up on this. He's actually looking at something that is called the dominance hypothesis. It's also the a kind of idea that we get from television shows, popular media, Flintstones, maybe you didn't see that. It's just kind of in the in the ether, in the in our in our environment as to why we have the kind of social structure that we do. So I put the words dominance hypothesis in quotes. In my opinion, this is not actually a hypothesis. It's just kind of a popular view of how things happen. And the idea is this, that females are simply the passive objects for male competition. So guys are going out and fighting each other to get dominance so they can have the female that they want. And the role of the female is just to sit back, watch the fight, and then have offspring with whoever gets to be the dominant male. So in this scenario, the males become, you know, the protective ones. They're aggressive. They've learned that from all this competition they had to do. And they're the providers. They're off going out and hunting and coming back with the stuff. In our, our parlance, bring home the bacon, bring home the meat to the female who has been sitting around with the little monkeys at home. Now, if you're the male going off and doing all this providing, bringing back the stuff for the female monkey at home, what do you want to make sure has not been happening while you're away? Christine is smiling. What do you want to ensure? has not been going on back home. Well, you've been off working so hard. In this scenario, the male then demands sexual exclusivity because who would want to go off and do all this work and then have all this monkey stuff going on and at home. And the idea is that you can do that if you do that, then you ensure genetic paternity because they're your offspring. And so you get from male dominance out to the stable nuclear families that we have today. So here we go. We've gone from male competition all the way up to leave it to beaver. And uh, I don't know, what's a good show about stable nuclear families these days? I guess that maybe there isn't one. Modern family, that's about funny families, but you know. The old shows, the 1950s shows about mom, dad, and 2.1 children and a little dog. So 
like I said, I'm, I'm calling this a hypothesis is 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 elevating it to a level of uh, science that it probably doesn't belong at. But you know, it's so ingrained in our society that we do have to test it out. We have to see. And baboons are potentially a mighty good test case for this hypothesis. For one thing, <laughs> they are not in stable nuclear families. The baboons are promiscuous. They have, they do not have place priority on long-term mating. They might have the same mates from season to season, but they can also switch it up. So they are promiscuous, but that doesn't mean random. That doesn't mean you're just mating wherever. They do have patterns. They seem to be making choices. So this helps us out because we can see who's mating with whom. And especially among the baboons, it's good because they're not having non-reproductive sex. So bonobos, for example, as we saw a little bit, maybe don't have as much non-reproductive sex as they do in zoos in the wild, but they do. They have a pretty wide sexual repertoire. And just because they're having sex does not mean they're going to have any new little bonobos. Where, whereas the baboons, like some species, have very specific times. Sometimes this is called being in heat, but that sounds kind of yucky so we'll just call it estrus where if they're going to be having sex they're probably going to be fertile so that you can track if you're a good baboon researcher you can track who's mating with whom and who's likely to have uh, paternity over the the new baboon they're also extremely aggressive strong and they have especially the males have teeth that are sharper than lions and they're not afraid or they don't shy back from using them uh, smuts tells us that on average there's a slash wound about one time a year on the females also in terms of body size the males are about two times as large as the females. So just to be clear, although we never want to discount human aggression, this is not the same <laughs> as humans. I hope we're not walking into our classrooms with a slash wound every year on average, we hope. This is different. Now, before we get into the what happens with the baboons, I want to talk about that sexual dimorphism a little bit. So among the baboons, males are about two times as large. And I thought it might be good to just go over some of the the primate sexual dimorphism by body size, uh, because it's something that uh, Muckle and Gonzalez and Camp talk about. So in the group of the old world monkeys and the apes and the humans, there is a range of variation of um, sexual dimorphism. As we saw among the monkeys in the Americas, there's not much. But that doesn't mean that they're all sexually dimorphic. The gibbons, for example, one of the apes, uh, is they are about the same size, males and females. And then there are several species in which the males are a little bit larger than females, about 8, 10 to 15 percent larger. Anybody know any primate species where the males are on average? a little bit larger than the females, eight to 15%, eight, 10, 15. Are we familiar with any primate species like that? Okay. 
on average, you know, there's some overlap and there's differences all the way around. But on average, this is true among humans. And it's also true among chimpanzees and bonobos, which is not extremely surprising, I guess, since that's our most recent common ancestor. We all share that. There are some species in which the males are about 50% larger than females, like the gorillas. Although, as I told you, this, or I mean, as I mentioned, that there's different groups of gorillas. There's mountain gorillas and lowland gorillas, and some of them have more sexual dimorphism by their group, not just within the species. We just saw the baboons, which is, that, that's going into the, the monkeys, but that's a pretty dramatic uh, dramatic difference. What I want you to note here is the variability across these groups. It's something that has been important to us when we we're talking about non-human primates and the human primate is how much diversity there is and variation within these groups. So some of it is variable by species, Others is variable by groups within the species. And of course, there's also individual variation. So when we say that men in the United States are on average 8% larger than women, that means there's going to be a lot of overlap. It's not that all the all the males group up at a group up at the larger than there's significant uh, overlap in terms of the range of variability. It also, in human beings, interestingly, this varies cross-culturally by a society and even historically. So when I used to look this up, I used to say 10 to 15%. In the United States, it's now looking like, you know, 7 or 8%. What could change? The amount of sexual dimorphism in a society like the United States over, say, the past hundred years. Yes, Cass. Dietary changes. What are you thinking about? How would we change our diets to... Yeah, I mean, that's that's certainly possible. You could just make things less healthy over time, and that might lead to differences in, uh, in the sexual dimorphism. I'm also just thinking about how parents would treat their offspring and their youngsters differently. In the old days, we used to say that the boys and the men would get the protein, get the biggest piece of chicken, and the girls could eat, you know, cakes and carbs. And that might have a difference between how people develop. There were also limitations about what sports and what things you were supposed to be able to do and how much you could move around. As those things have hopefully been <laughs> reducing a little bit, so has the, the dimorphism biologically speaking. So what we do culturally can have important effects on our developing bodies and our, our biology as well. So baboon finding, what do we find out there? Well, as some of you did notice that this is just because you have male dominance and male competition doesn't mean that the females don't have any role in uh, in their their choice of mates and who they would be hang out with a lot. And um, Barbara Smuts begins to talk about what she calls friendships. Alex, how does she know that the baboons are friends? Yeah, she's, we have to be careful here. When she says friendship, right? 
That doesn't mean she can talk to them and ask them about how they define a friend or look up their social media accounts to see who's in their circles. She's doing a measure of if they're grooming each other and if they're close to each other over time. And she discovers something that's kind of uh, that's pretty interesting is that it, it's not the it's not the most dominant males that have the most friends, but the older ones. Now, what do the what do the females get out of being friends with males? Ariana, what do they get from that? Yeah, they get protection, right? We've just learned about how there's, we have these aggressive and sometimes quite violent, vicious males. If they have a friend, they get protection and they get access to those resources and feeding spots. They also get something which is care for offspring infant care. And here, again, Smuts has been tracking this, and this has been confirmed now. This article was written before we could do genetic testing, but this has actually been confirmed by genetic testing now that the male friends might care for infants that are not necessarily their own, that are not genetically related. And they will care for their own, but statistically speaking, it's actually more likely, you're more likely to get care from a male friend than you are from simple a simple paternity relationship. Now, you might ask yourselves, well, what is the male friend getting from this? And Smut speculates that this may increase their mating chances later on. So there's not an immediate benefit, but over time, this might work out for them. Again, this article was written before we had, we could do genetic testing on this, but this is another finding that has been um, at least corroborated, reinforced by the genetic testing that there is this benefit later on for the, for the male. So we now return to our hypothesis, the male dominance hypothesis. Do these ideas about the origins of family life from male dominance, are they supported? And the answer, of course, is the big old no. What do we see instead? We see that you can have long-term social bonds, these friendships and relationships over time, but the baboons show us that they can do this without having a division of labor between one sex is going out and getting the food or and bringing it back or sharing food. So there's not a, a what we call a sexual division of labor amongst the baboons, and yet they still have these long-term social bonds. We also see that you can have friendship and not necessarily have sexual exclusivity demands. So you can have these relationships, but they are not demanding only, only uh, sexual rights over the other. And we have males performing parental or caring roles with infants without necessarily needing to have biological or genetic paternity. So the baboons help us to falsify this male dominance hypothesis for the origins of family life. And uh, this is a good, Example because in the next 
reading for Monday, we'll be talking about a little bit about hypotheses and theories in science. And uh, the way that science works, which can be frustrating sometimes to people, is it works by falsifying hypotheses. So you come up with an idea, hypothesis to test, and you go out and see if you can falsify it. In this case, it was falsified. Does that prove something else? We often talk about proving the hypothesis. Actually, no. Hypotheses can be falsified, but probably never completely proven, which makes science sometimes frustrating because you're always trying to, to in some ways, invalidate ideas. And so it always looks like they're changing their minds, but it's, all, it's, it's a process of self-correcting hypothesis testing. In this case, we don't, we cannot, we cannot necessarily say that there's, uh, there's that the origins of, of family life are, uh, we haven't proven where it comes from, but we have disproven this idea that it comes from uh, the male dominance hypothesis. So the other super important point for this, and it's hopefully something that's a part of the uh, the we are primates chapter is that people look to the non-human primates and they say they want to look for evidence to support what they see in human beings. And so if they want to support long-term monogamous relationships, uh, they'll try and find a primate species that does it and say, aha, there you go. Or if they believe that humans are naturally aggressive or naturally peaceful. Uh, some people will go to the chimpanzees and say, aha, there you go, look at them fighting each other. Or they'll go to the bonobos and say, aha, look at all that sex and peace they're having. Look at those dominant females, etc." So just be careful. People often look to primates to support whatever ideas they have about humans but in fact, when we look at the non-human primates, we see exactly what we see among humans, which is a wide variation and diversity in terms of our behaviors, ideas, and uh, social abilities. 